The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship on this beautiful, beautiful sunny day. Uh, thank you all for joining us here. I have a couple announcements I want to lift up. Uh, first one is the uh, prayer fellowship is going to be meeting this Wednesday in my study at 9 to 30 in the morning. So please, you're more than welcome to come. Um, we're going to offer up some prayers, and it's going to be a, a good time. I think it'll be a good time. Um, also, we're going to start something new next Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a coffee hour in the morning, starting at, is it next Sunday? No, two Sundays. Excuse no, three. Me. August 27th. It's the fourth Sunday. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> They said that was the The 27th. Yeah. Um, but we're going to start something new on the 27th. So certainly keep an eye out for that as we get closer. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, it's going to be something new. We'll try it out. Uh, and hopefully it'll, it'll be something that'll last. Um, also, I just want to have a, a, another update on uh, Al Smith. His uh, quadruple heart bypass went well. Uh, the prayers were answered, and as far as I know, I think he's recovering all right. Do you have any more updates of Lord Sergio? He's still in ICU. Okay, yes. still in ICU. He's doing well. Good, good. And uh, again, we're so grateful for all the prayers and loving support from this church family. Yeah, I, I think you all did such a great job. I know several folks visited. Betsy and I went out there, and it was just a good show of support for our, our dear brother Al. And like I said, I praise God that he uh, came through it all right, and now he's in the recovery. So. Uh, are there any other announcements you wish to lift up this morning? All right. Seeing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Thank you. 
Please join me in our responsive call to worship. Anyone who thirsts, come and drink. If you have no money, but you're hungry, come and receive living water without a price tag. Why do you spend money on what does not nourish you? Why do you work for what does not nurture you? Listen, come and eat eternal food that will delight you. Come and partake in the spirit that will give you life. Become a witness of God's free gift of grace to all people. They will come running to you because our heavenly God raises up, transforms, and makes new. Our hymn is number 356. Come down, found the very
everyone. God is gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love. And he gives us forgiveness and peace. We do not have to earn it with sacrifice because it is a free gift given to us. Forgiveness is ours in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good 
and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, 
But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that those, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. When in the course of a sermon series, sooner or later, one comes across a text that sparks the intellect and stokes the flames of debate. Today includes one such passage. Truthfully, there's a lot of theology in these five verses, and I could easily craft at least three 30-minute sermons from it. Alas, I did not do that, <laughs> so I have about 15 minutes to dive into some hotly debated material. This means today's sermon is going to be a basic exposition of traditional Reformed theology. For more detailed analysis, I certainly invite you to come to any of our upcoming Bible studies, which start in September. So let us begin. Last Sunday, we ended on Paul's urging us to wait patiently. The apostle is fully aware that in our waiting and enduring, we are susceptible to weakness. We are surely encouraged to wait in active anticipation with the hope of our adoption. We are encouraged to wait in active sanctification of ourselves and in active witness to the gospel. Nevertheless, in our waiting, we will all succumb to weakness. Paul says elsewhere that in our weakness, we boast not of ourselves, but of God. God uses our weakness to direct our gaze to his power. When calamity strikes and we are beaten low, we see that our strongest human strength is worth nothing. For even the strongest man on earth has a weakness, but in God there is no weakness at all. In that moment of calamity, the Christian looks to God for God's strength knowing full well that God's power lifts up the downtrodden and the weak. So here arises a simple question. How? Paul answers this by way of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent who acts within human beings, bringing about God's purposes. The Apostle's logical progression is this. We are adopted heirs with Christ, but adoption does not preclude suffering. So when we suffer, we turn to God, and when we turn to God, we turn in prayer. This is why Paul says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, because perplexity as to how to pray for oneself is a universal Christian experience. Our inarticulate longings to pray, however, are an indication that the indwelling Spirit is already helping us by interceding for us in our hearts, making requests that the Father will certainly hear. Think of those people you know who died much sooner than expected. 
In those moments, you cannot find the words to pray, but in that same moment, the Holy Spirit is lifting up a prayer. Now, this is going to be a terrible simile, but the Spirit is like a middleman. He both brings God's power and comfort to us, while also lifting our prayers and longings to God. Now, the Spirit doesn't intercede wantonly, nor does He intercede according to our wishes or desires. Rather, the Holy Ghost intercedes according to the will of God. And then Paul says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, I don't want to speak for God. So I cannot deny 100% that God does not bless some Christians with prosperity. So I can't say that some folks won't be blessed with health, wealth, and leisure in this life. But I don't believe this is what Paul is talking about. The context of chapter 8 dictates that Paul is talking about the adoption of of God's people and the eternal good that comes with that. The apostle is very realistic. He and others sh do not shy away from the very real persecutions of the earliest Christians. And while our persecutions pale in comparison to theirs, nonetheless we too will experience suffering and hardship. <clears throat> now this is where we're going to transition into some heavy theology. What Paul is talking about falls under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. Paul says that all things work together for good for those who love God. Let me give you a biblical example. Back in Genesis chapter 37, we hear of the young boy named Joseph. He is one of the twelve sons of Jacob. And his Dreams and his father's favoritism put him at enmity with his other brothers. So much so that the other brothers hated Joseph. And so they planned to kill him. Their own brother. Thankfully, one of them convinced the others not to commit outright fratricide, but they nevertheless premeditated and elaborate plan to make his death look like an accident. Not only did they premeditate this manslaughter, they also conspired to sell their brother into slavery. Truly evil actions. But fast forward in the story. After Joseph has been made prime minister of Egypt, and after a famine has swept the Middle East, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt for food because of Joseph's wise economic plan. And in the very last chapter of the book of Genesis, in the final verses, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it. God is perfectly good. God cannot commit evil. But God is also perfectly sovereign, which means he can use the evil that men and women do, the harm that humans inflict on others. God can and does use them for his very good purpose. And that purpose, that purpose is the preservation and the perseverance of his adopted children. Whatever God ordains is ultimately for good. And not all things on earth are good. But all things, as Paul says, are working for good for God's children. Those who love God need not fear calamity. While I'm sure Joseph was terrified when he was enslaved and imprisoned, his love for God 
never waned. And God's protection and blessing never left Joseph. Even if it seemed from Joseph's perspective that God was far away. God's plans are perfectly good, but because God is working and dealing with humans, broken and sinful mortals, some of the things that God allows to happen are not good in the present, but may even be quite good. But because of God's sovereignty over all of the created order, tragedy is only temporary and ephemeral for believers. Now this brief exposition on God's sovereignty naturally leads the Apostle Paul into verses 29 and 30, where we get what some theologians call the plan of salvation and what others like myself call the golden chain. Now, if you remember at the beginning of this sermon, I said we'll be teaching traditional Reformed perspective. And that remains the case. So if you were raised in the modern Lutheran tradition or as a Methodist or a Catholic or any branch of Christianity that ascribes to Arminianism, then the following may sound a bit strange or even offensive. But I promise I mean no offense as we skim, skim the very surface of predestination. The first link in the golden chain is foreknowledge. The Greek word Paul uses is proegno, which comes from the word gnosis with the prefix pro. We get the modern medical term prognosis. Now gnosis means to know. And this prefix means before, or beforehand. So in Greek thought, there are two main types of knowing. There is cognitive knowing, meaning I know the time, you know my name, so-and-so knows rocket science. Cognitive knowing. Speaking theologically, this knowing is a cognitive awareness or a simple awareness of God. The second kind of knowing is a personal knowing. For instance, whenever you read in the Old Testament and Jacob knew his wife and she bore him a son or anything like that, that type of knowing is intimate and personal. The Bible is not trying to shy away from using sexual activity languages. No, they're talking specifically about a type of knowledge that is intimate and is deeply personal. So speaking theologically, this knowing is redemptive, and it is made personal by the Holy Spirit. Because of his sovereignty, God foreknows every single person intimately, not just cognitively. From before the foundation of the earth, God knows you, and he knows me intimately and personal. God knows whom he has called. This is important to know because foreknowledge is the starting point of predestination. If God is sovereign and knows everything, and if everything works according to his good pleasure, then predestination is how God interacts with the world. Now, this isn't something that only Calvin came up with. This isn't even limited to the reformers like Luther. St. Augustine wrote prolifically on predestination and election. But it isn't, isn't even unique to him either. It's not unique to Paul or even to Jesus. Predestination is not some doctrine created out of nothing. It is deeply rooted in the oldest traditions of the Old Testament. The original destiny for humanity was the one-on-one -on -one relationship between God and his people established in the Garden of Eden. Sin got in the way of that relationship, but the destiny has never changed. It's only been pushed ahead to a time that we cannot fathom. But the destiny has remained the same. The way we get to that destination is chronicled in the Bible. 
Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. The goal then of predestination is that God's elect be conformed by and to Christ. Everything points back to Christ because he is God's incarnate word. This is why Paul says in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. We receive our adoption by way of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are to be conformed to Jesus Christ. Those who are called by God are to imitate Christ in everything that we say. <coughs> Predestination and our election are not free licenses to do whatever we want. Nor are we guaranteed prosperity and safety in this life. Predestination means the elect must conform their lives to Christ, which is no easy task when compared to the frivolity of the world. Christ demands a lot of his disciples. Remember the double love rule. Christ wants us to love God with our whole selves and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. It would be so much easier if we only had to do one of those things, or if he told us we could love partially. But he didn't. God requires of us that we love him fully, that we dedicate our lives to his word and in everything, give all glory and honor God requires of us that we love all of our neighbors, not just the ones we like or are related to, all of them, and even our enemies. Now, I cannot say to you or on your behalf whether or not you are part of the elect. Calvin says only you know if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. I cannot, nor do I want to, Cast that judgment. But my question to you today is how are you responding to your calling? <clears throat> Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Do you love your neighbors as you love yourself? Let us pray. Sovereign God, you established your church from before the foundations of this world. You know each of us by name, and you call us each by name. Teach us to pray in the midst of the groans and pains of this world. O Holy Spirit, intercede for us and with us, that we may be conformed to the image of Christ, our head and brother. We are chosen people, called for God's service. Help us in this endeavor. Amen. And now, my friends, moved by the Holy Spirit, I invite you to please stand and profess your faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven. Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. But the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. God has been generous in providing for our needs. Let us therefore give back a portion of what has already been given to us. 
that united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and sacraments that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those with incurable and stigmatized diseases, those unjustly imprisoned, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned. As you have moved toward us in love, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering in the name of Jesus Christ. Sustain those among us who need your healing touch. Make the sick whole. Give hope to the dying. Comfort those who mourn. Uphold all who suffer in body or mind, not only those we know and love, but also those known only to you, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. With thanksgiving, we remember before you those saints who bore witness to the light, their presence on earth is no longer with us. Through our grief, we give praises knowing they are in peace with you. Grant that we may persevere in the faith to which we have been called, and at the end, behold your glory. O oh God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 282, If Thou But Trust in God to Guide Thee.
said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, this is the Lord's table open for all repentant sinners who proclaim Jesus as their Savior. The Apostle Paul urges us to examine ourselves for all who eat and drink without discernment, eat and drink judgment against themselves. Therefore, I invite all of us to prepare our hearts for the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in lies. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to those with ears to hear. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and a holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. According to Christ's commandment, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O oh God, that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory. And we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honors are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And Christ Jesus instructed us that when we pray, we do so as he taught us. Therefore we pray boldly, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread, and after giving
giving thanks to God, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Whatever you do, do it. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. And after blessing it, he gave it to his disciples saying, this sign is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. So every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again in glory. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be fed. Friends, the gifts of God for the people of God are prepared before you. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. <clears throat> Help us who have shared Christ's body and received his cup to be his faithful disciples, so that our daily living may be part of the life of your kingdom, and our love be your love reaching out into the life of the world. 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. 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 And now I invite you to stand and sing our final hymn, number 384, of Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Thank you. 